do have skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. Morena, Etiamana, Tenakoto, Enakomihana. Some changes in personnel, Mr. Chair. Uh, at the front table today, Ms. Beaton and I are joined by Ruth Thomas, who will lead today's witnesses. Mr. Um, Thomas, thank you. Mr. Stone is here today uh, in place of Annette Sykes, who uh, has been called to other matters today. Mr. Stone, welcome. Uh, it is also a pleasure to welcome um, Paula Tessarero, the Disability Rights Commissioner from the Human Rights Commission. And in a moment, uh, we will invite uh, Ms. Tessarero to give an address or a short statement on behalf of the Human Rights Commission. Uh, following that, we have three witnesses scheduled today. Uh, they are Robert Martin, Anne Else and Dallas Pickering. Uh, and as I said a moment ago, Ruth Thomas will uh, lead their evidence. Um, but as I say, the first order of the day is um, for the statement from the Human Rights Commission and uh, the Disability Rights Commissioner. Thank you. Ms. Tessa Riero, my colleagues and I have been made aware of uh, the statement uh, to be made uh, for and on behalf of the Human Rights Commission with you as Disability Rights Commissioner and I would invite you now to make that statement. Enga mana, enga rei rauranga rau tērama tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Paula Tesorero tako ingoa, ko Oti Hoatanga mō te kāhui te katangata ki o te roa. Nō rei rā tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Mauri tangata, mauri ora. Thank you, Mr Chair. I would first like to acknowledge those who have fought so hard for this inquiry to take place. It is because of the courage and persistence of many people over many decades that I have the opportunity to address you today. And equally, I acknowledge all survivors. You were failed by the very system that claimed to protect you. We owe it to you to get this inquiry right. I acknowledge you all who helped raise awareness of the wrongs that were inflicted on you, those of you who suffered in silence, and those who are no longer with us. Moi mai rā. I also wish to acknowledge those who have gone before me at the Human Rights Commission. Later in the week, you will hear from the former Chief Human Rights Commissioner, Rosalind Noonan, about the important work that the Commission did in this area during her tenure as the Chief. I also acknowledge the clarity, commitment and tenacity of both Paul Gibson, my predecessor, and the former Race Relations Commissioner, Dame Susan Devoy. They and their teams were instrumental in building the momentum leading to this inquiry, and I thank them for their mahi. In particular, the Ekore Ano Never Again campaign, launched in 2017, contributed to greater public awareness about the nature and extent of the abuse that occurred in places under the control of the state. Many New Zealanders signed the Human Rights Commission's open letter to the then Prime Minister, demanding justice for survivors of state abuse and calling for an independent inquiry. The present government made a commitment during the last election to establish an inquiry into the abuse of children in state care within its first 100 days in office. This promise formed the basis of the inquiry we have today. Why is this a human rights issue? The Human Rights Commission retains a strong interest in these matters and in the work of this inquiry. Abuse of citizens at the hand of the state constitutes a grave human rights violation. Indeed, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was developed in response to the atrocities that occurred during World War II and the fatal consequences of a state devaluing its citizens based on certain characteristics. This inquiry has already heard powerful words about colonisation, about breaches of Te Tiriti o Waitangi, New Zealand's own human rights document. New Zealand was a significant architect of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and Obligations under Te Tiriti, 
are echoed in the Universal Declaration. Both documents call for equality. Since the Universal Declaration 71 years ago, New Zealand has signed up to several other major human rights treaties, including the United Nations Convention Against Torture, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. We have also endorsed the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. These international commitments all detail how New Zealand will promote the human rights of particular groups of people. They also reinforce the New Zealand government's obligation to honour Te Tiriti. We like to think of ourselves as human rights leaders, a great place to bring up children with a fair and just society. But it's not true for everyone. Our institutions and systems have failed many of those whose rights we were meant to uphold. These victims include children and young people, and those who have experience of mental, intellectual and physical impairment. We recognise the burden of abuse has fallen disproportionately on Māori. The inquiry will assist in exploring the true depth and magnitude of that burden, one that has not been out in the open or acknowledged for Māori and for disabled people and for many others. We know from the stories we've already heard that the physical, sexual and emotional abuse inflicted on thousands of people have had horrific long-term, often intergenerational impacts. I'd like to focus specifically on the impact of state abuse on disabled people. You have heard and will continue to hear from many during this contextual hearing and throughout the inquiry about the experience of disabled people in the care of the state. Anyone who has experienced abuse in the care of the state can face personal, structural and environmental obstacles when they come forward and seek acknowledgement of their experiences and answers to their questions. But disabled people may be further hindered by additional social, physical and emotional barriers. These make it even harder for them to tell their stories to be taken seriously and to access and participate in accountability processes. Systems that are already convoluted, unwelcoming and obscure can become effectively impregnable. The system can take advantage of this silence. In 2017, the Human Rights Commission engaged the Donald Beasley Institute to undertake some research to find out what was known about the abuse of people with learning disabilities and other types of impairments in state care. You have already heard from Dr Bridget Mervyn Veitch about the out outcome of that project. Her findings provided a small glimpse into the experiences of a group that have been effectively invisible from the community, both because of the manner in which they were historically detained, but also in the public consciousness. In 2008, New Zealand ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. The Convention does not accord new or additional rights to disabled people. It articulates the measures needed to overcome the structural discrimination that has prevented disabled people from enjoying universal human rights on an equal basis with others. It is therefore totally applicable to the early period of focus of this inquiry as well as in the present. New Zealand made a commitment to uphold the rights in that Convention and I want to highlight just a few that are relevant to this inquiry. The right to equal recognition of the law, the right to access to justice, the right to liberty and security of the person, the right to freedom from torture, cruel, inhumane and degrading treatment or punishment, the right to freedom from exploitation, violence and abuse, the right to live independently and the right to... Get to the end faster? The ones relevant to the context of this inquiry are the right to equal recognition before the law, the right to access to justice, the right to liberty and security of the person, the right to freedom from torture and cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment or punishment, the right to freedom 
from exploitation, violence and abuse. The right to live independently and be included in the community. The right to respect for home and family. The Convention states that in no case shall a child be separated from parents on the basis of a disability of either the child or one or both of the parents. I urge you to actively uphold these commitments during the course of this inquiry and particularly as you shape a vision for the future. To assist you in doing so, I direct your attention to relevant jurisprudence of the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities with regard to legal agency and supported decision making. I refer you to General Comment Number 1 on Article 12, Equal Recognition Before the Law, and the associated March 2018 report of the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and her 2019 report to the Human Rights Council on ending the deprivation of liberty on the basis of disability. Commissioners, I acknowledge the considerable work that you've put in to date. You have a complex task and hold a huge amount of hope in your hands. I wish you well in your endeavours. I also want to make clear my expectations as a Disability Rights Commissioner for this process. In my view, the inquiry must model a human rights approach, consistent with Te Tiriti o Waitangi. This means tinoranga teratanga, full participation by affected people, meaningful accountability, oretitanga, equality and transparency. It means looking beyond detention or protection, beyond inclusion to agency. I want to see an inquiry that places the survivors at the centre, an inquiry that is truly and genuinely concerned with the well-being of those who have been affected. An inquiry that will do whatever it takes to be accessible and inclusive and to promote, encourage and enable all to participate. I hope it will be founded on principles of non-discrimination and empowerment. It will be consistent with the state's obligations and commitments under Te Tiriti. It will give meaningful effect to those duties and responsibilities. It must acknowledge the many losses suffered, loss of the whakapapa, identity, educational opportunity, income and well-being, and losses of life. It must lead to accountability and mechanisms for tailored redress and rehabilitation, and it must help make wrong make good the wrongs that have occurred and the injustices done. I want to see the inquiry carefully consider whether New Zealand has complied with its domestic and international obligations. Have we fulfilled the commitments made on the international stage? Are we the human rights leaders we want to be? I would like to see an apology, a meaningful, genuine apology for what happened one that will mean something to those who survived the abuse that was inflicted on them, that will acknowledge the enduring hurt and trauma and assist individuals to find a pathway forward. It must consider contemporary experiences because disabled people continue to experience abuse within state-funded services and continue to be neglected, bullied, abused and silenced as we do in wider society. We must ensure that the lessons are learnt from the past to deal effectively with the present and the future. And I know you will act with urgency when existing abuse is brought to your attention. Finally, most of all, I want this inquiry to build towards a future where no one is detained solely because they are disabled or Māori or impoverished. I want to see courageous honesty about the structures that continue to perpetuate abuse. We must dismantle not only the physical, but also the conceptual walls that work to separate us 
and which devalue diversity and difference. These continue to create fertile ground for abuse. Fulfilling our human rights obligations by ensuring truly equitable access to adequate resources, by upholding the right to support and exercise legal agency, and by ensuring all voices are heard, is the best way to ensure that these things cease and will no longer again be part of our future. E koreano. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Tesoriero. Uh, please convey the compliments of the Royal Commission and its members uh, to your colleagues, uh, Professor Paul Hunt, Mr Meng Foon and Ms Karenina Sumel. Thank you.